when it comes to pipettes um is identifying whether they are large pipettes or small pipettes now um it's not just a random way of assigning groups actually large pipettes and small pipettes are genetically also very different um and they fall within the same clade so all large pipettes come under the banner of large pipettes and all small pipettes come under the banner of small pipettes also. um large pipettes are pipettes for example in this case the paddy field pipet um their plumage remains the same once they are adults their plumage remains the same in all seasons except for the regular molt molting and wearing um, wear cycles um the flanks tend to be plain and not streaked and they are generally bigger um than their uh, than the other pipettes well as the name as the name says um small pipettes um are generally nahi you did it माइक्रोफोन All right. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um also I just want to know I just want to know if you can see my cursor. <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. Um so with small pipettes one of the things is that their plumage tends to be seasonal so you'll find a breeding plumage and you'll find a non breeding plumage um in india of course we tend to see the non breeding plumage more often than the breeding plumage but there are some species for which the breeding plumage is equally important um the flanks this area here tends to be streaked and um again in size as the name suggests they are generally smaller although there are examples and exceptions to the rule all right um here's a first winter richard's pipit and i'll just run you through the features of the bird um on the plumage that you tend to look for when you're looking at pipits so starting with the bill and um basically this is also a guide to the terminology i'll be using in the presentation from here onwards so starting with the bill there's the lores here so the region between the bill and the eyes is the lores this is the crown this is the nape the ears basically i'll call them ear coverts right this is the melar stripe the mantle is this point here where the head meets the back the median coverts these feathers over here the breast streaking and the flanks and of course there's the tail and the vent but i probably won't ever speak about them it's mostly these features here that will define a lot of the birds that we talk about it onwards um if you want to understand pipits one of the things unfortunately that's a bit complex but you have to get a bit familiar with is aging pipits and in this case i'll take you through the ages and the molts of paddy field pipits because that's the pipit most of us um are more most likely to see in um when birding outside at a place near our at near our houses or anywhere in india really um because there are only resident um and truly non migratory species of pipit right so in this case we'll start with the juvenile um paddy field pipit um there's an adult here and this is a juvenile here um the juvenile as you'll notice tends to have a lot of scales all over the body um this scalation um these feathers which i basically have um these scalations basically are feathers which have black dots in the middle and fringed by buffy um edges um and so creates this uh, this sort of uh, impression of having scales all across from the crown down through the mantle to the back um and this is a feature of almost all juvenile pipits and even juvenile larks for that matter um and it remains very similar throughout most pipits but in the larger pipits particularly what was worth noticing 
is how the median coverts change. So for young birds, pretty much all birds have median coverts which are pale to buffy in color. So this is another paddy field pipit and the juvenile. So here you can see the um, the scalations are very clear all throughout. And you can see the pale fringes to the median coverts um, over here, right? Um, so this is a juvenile pipit. This is usually what we will see in during the monsoon, depending on which part of the world you are, part of the country you are in. Um, if you're in the south, usually uh, around June to July is when you see this plumage in pipits, uh, maybe July to August in the north. Um, from the juvenile, you get to this first winter kind of plumage starting in autumn. Um, you can tell these birds actually age really fast. So they lose these scaled feathers and it becomes kind of like a motley back. And the fringes to the median coverts especially become very pale. And this is a very important point to note because um, the pale fringes remain the same in Blythe's pipettes and in Richard's pipettes and in Paddy Field pipettes. Um, Richard's pipettes, uh, sorry, Blythe's pipettes, there's one of the features is that they have a wing bar. Um, but it's important to note that in immature plumages, all of these pipettes, which look very similar to each other, have these wing bars because of this um, aging factor. Um, so this is a paddy field pipette, like I said earlier. It's developing the semblance of the loads. There's a pale fringing here. It's lost most of the scalation and gotten the clean mantle. Um, we'll move on to how it progresses. So this is a bird that has entered now, crossed the first winter, and it's aged. You can see the feathers have completely worn out. So they started with the scalations here. The scalations, as the feathers wear, the the feathers, the, it looks more like mottling as opposed to scales, eventually becomes kind of like vague streaking on this bird. And the pale fringes still remain. So this is approximately in the month of March and April. Um, and this is a very fresh plumage adult because it's basically it's first spring. And so the pale fringes remain, and but they're not as pale as they used to be when it was a first winter bird. And then coming into the full adult plumage from here, after let's say a bird has tried to breed for the first time, um, it'll go into its autumn plumage, which is basically the time of the year when they're in the worst, worst plumage, so to say. It's the most worn out plumage. Um, so everything is really plain. They generally look very bland overall. All the features are washed out. Um, and also it's a it's the time of the year when we start seeing other pipettes coming in. So it's it can get a little confusing. A lot of paddy field pipettes at this point of the year look a lot like thorny pipettes because there's hardly any streaking on the back and on the on the breast. Um, coming into winter again, but autumn, because they lose all their feathers, this is the most worn out state. Coming into winter, this again, this is what a typical adult paddy field pipette will look like. So fairly fresh back feathers, um, slightly worn out on the edges here in this case, but fairly fresh, something like this. Uh, the crown is nice and streaky. There's a nice break in the mantle. Um, and generally, the edges of the median coverts, as you'll notice, get buffier and buffier with time until they become almost the same color, um, same tone of brown as the rest of the plumage. Now in Blythe's pipettes, we'll get to that later, but I'll just uh, notify you guys. Um, in Blythe's pipettes, these remain white throughout. <sighs> so we'll start with paddy field pipettes. Now with paddy field pipettes, this entire, all the birds we just saw were paddy field pipettes, but I'll focus on them particularly now. Um, so as you, can, as you can tell by the age of the bird now, hopefully if you followed the previous photographs, this particular bird that we're looking at here is a first winter bird because it's still got the pale fringes to the median coverts. It's got the kind of slightly worn out uh, back and crown, but fairly vague and mottled. If you uh, look very closely, you can also see the fleshy gape, which gives you an idea that it's just um, it's a kind of, it's an immature bird, it's not an adult yet. Now, paddy field pipettes. Um, 
are generally the pivot I would recommend. So you can forget about all other pivots, but basically try as hard as possible to try and identify paddy field pivots as paddy field pivots when you can. Um, that's because it's the most familiar pivot to most of us. It's the most common pivot. And it's the pivot, if you get used to this pivot, every other pivot that's not this pivot will become easier to ID. Um, so when you start up with paddy field pipettes, what I look for is the overall structure of the bird. So once you've identified it's a large, large pipette, you know it's a large pipette because there's no sticking on the flanks. It generally is a very sparrow plus kind of size, size, sized bird. Um, you look at, so the things I look for are the loads, um, are the beak and the structure. So it's a fairly compact bird. It's got a short tail and this will become more evident when we look at other species. Um, what I mean by this, was then you'll be able to compare what, you, what I mean by a short tail. But it's got a short tail. It's got a fairly big head. Um, and it's got a, it's the bill especially, and this is a feature of paddy field pipettes, is always dual toned. So there's a yellow to the base of the bill. There's a dark upper mandible. And at the tip of the mandible, there's always this curve. Now, this is important because pretty much the only species of pipit that shows this otherwise is occasionally Richards and occasionally Tawny. But paddy field pipit almost always shows a bill like this. To give you an example of an adult, that curved culmin over here, the base to the bill, and the dark upper mandible. So this basically forms this classic paddy field pipit bill followed by the largish head and the very short tail compared to other pipettes that will, that will follow from here. Um, basically, the tail is almost half the size of the body um, in almost all cases. Um, people tend to focus a lot on hind claws. I don't really care much about them, um, largely because in the field, they're very hard to see, but also because they're very variable. As you can see, this is a paddy field pipette with very long hind claws. And here, there's a paddy field pipette with hardly any. Um, the same length of hind claws as almost the front claws. Right. Um, another thing about paddy field pipette, before we move on to the chet pipette, is um, what I would look at, um, and just keep it in mind over here. So there's a short tail, there's a bill shape, there's a large headed appearance. Um, there's a vague streaking. It's not completely plain. It's kind of vague. There's a distinct break in streaking on the mantle. You'll notice there's nothing here. It's very clean. There's some crown stripes. So this looks like the streaking starts here, breaks here, continues here. And there's vague breast streaks. Sorry. Um, and now we come to the next bird, which is the Richard's pipette, um, which is, again, very similar to paddy field pipette. And so similar that they were actually considered the same bird for the longest time. And they were the same species um, of pipit for the longest time. Um, so Richard's pipit and paddy field pipit were considered the same. But Richard's pipit, as you will notice, is noticeably larger, um, not just in size, which, is, which it is. I'll give a good example of that later. But also in that, it has a bigger body. It looks like it has a pot belly. Now there are examples of Richard's pipette where it doesn't look like it has a pot belly, but most Richard pipettes tend to have this feature where it looks like it's been well fed, essentially. Um, it's got, because of the large size, um, its head appears really small. So if you look at proportions of the paddy field pipette where it's large headed, you can see what I mean when I say Richard's pipette is small headed. Because the small head in proportion to the body really stands out. And the tail, as you can see, is really long. So it gives you an impression of a pipette sized thrush more than a sparrow sized pipette, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, so, structurally, in a sense, it looks fairly different, even though it's superficially the same. It's structurally quite different to a paddy field pipette. Um, if you look at the bill, ooh, not a good quality here. Here we have another uh, Richard's pipette, and I'll just give you the example of the bill over here. It has a very similar bill to the paddy field pipette. The one thing I find is often different or more variable than a paddy field pipette is that it doesn't always have the yellow to the base. So the bill is often sometimes is dual toned, sometimes is a single tone. 
and there's always the curve to the upper culmen very similar to the paddy field pipette um one thing that all books and guides also teach us is to look at the lows um so paddy field pipette as you'll notice have marked lows but there are examples um of paddy field pipettes where the lows are very worn out so especially in the autumn plumage for example you'll notice that the lows are um they're very faded um richard pipettes almost always shows pale lows i say almost always because there are examples where for example in this case um, as you can see the lows appear marked almost as marked as the autumn paddy field pipette now this might be um so basically what i'm trying to say is if the lows are marked and are well marked it's not richards but if they're completely pale it's likely to be richards um so it's a thing of it's it's a good pointer if you're looking at extremes but anything in the middle there's a lot of overlap um another thing that um i would look at is the streaking on the bird um the streaking on the bird as you can see in this case um not a good example in this case i'm sorry i'll just look here the streaking starts on the crown and then becomes motley on the mantle but seems to continue seamlessly on to the back um and this is um different to the paddy field pipette where there is generally a very clean mantle in adult birds um another thing that people try to look at and i think i'll compare this when we get to um blight pipettes are the median coverts so if you are waiting on the median coverts just hold on for a while um I look at another richard pipit this is a juvenile bird um actually an immature bird um you can tell because you can see the white fringing to the median coverts in the other examples the fringing to the median coverts was always buffish um we will very rarely only if you are looking at a bird before let's say december will you see this plumage um but i have very rarely seen juvenile birds in india um maybe in northern india they they might be more common on northeast um on passage but at least where i used to look at these birds very often in south india i rarely ever saw an immature bird um but even in immature plumage you can see that there's no laurel stripe um the crown streaks very um go on to become mottling on the mantle and then down to streaks on the back um overall the structure remains same which is a very paddy field like bill in this case for example it has a dual tone bill but looks very small headed has a long tail and looks kind of pot bellied a very bulky looking bird um with laurel stripes another thing to remember uh, and i can uh, imagine this getting a bit confusing now laurel stripes are best judged when you look at the side profile of the bird because if you look at the bird from the front even if it has a laurel stripe it will always appear to not have one and if you look at it from the back even if it doesn't have one it will appear to have one um so with angles the lores actually look very different so the ideal way to see laurels judge the laurel stripe is to actually look at the bird from the side um and again which is one of the reasons i tend not to look at it as a field feature but it's a great feature uh, to observe in photographs if you're trying to id from photographs now this is one example of a richard pipit on the top over here and a paddy field pipit um on the bottom so even though these birds you know if i look individually without a reference they can look fairly similar um when they are together you can see what i mean by a much larger pipit and paddy field pipit generally being a much smaller pipit and i particularly like this photo because a it shows these massive hind claws of a uh, of a richard pipit which although normally i don't recommend when there's a frame of reference such as another pipit next to you they really they really stand out as long hind claws um you can tell now that the tail is much longer the head is pretty much the, almost a similar size to that of a paddy field pipit but the body is so much bigger that it appears small headed and this one appears a bit larger headed um another thing that's very interesting here is 
this is normally how you would see the birds from a distance through your binoculars and both of them appear to have pale lores in this case um just something to keep in mind because when you're looking at birds from that kind of distance um just a reminder that lores are probably not the best um id feature to look at um and just keeping on with the aging discussion we had earlier um you can tell that this is an adult bird it's got the buffy fringes to its median coverts in this case it might actually be a first winter bird um with those very pale fringes to the median covert it's quite possible that this bird is actually in autumn and it might just be a very worn out paddy field pipit and hence the lores also appear very washed out right um now we are on to blight pipits excuse me now um this is probably my favorite species of pipit um and you can see how this also looks a lot like the trifecta uh, i call it the trifecta of blights richards and paddy field these three pipits look very similar to each other um and you can see why however i think out of all of these three blights pipit is the most distinctive pipit there's a number of reasons for that to start with um blights pipit has completely pale lores always there is hardly any example you see of a blight pipit with any markings on the lores at all the bill is very fine compared to that of the paddy field pipit and the richard pipit and is almost always appears pointed as opposed to curved at the tip um the white fringes to the median coverts and the other coverts here and the flight sorry the tertials here and for example in this case the primaries as well um they make it appear as though it has wing bars even in the adult birds um so something for example if you were to see a pipit with wing bars in march or in february when when paddy field and richards would have lost their you know white uh, fringes to the median coverts then you know that it's a blight pipit um given that it's a large pipit um the other thing to note is because of the lores when you see this bird from a distance it always appears as though the supercilium starts behind the eye um which is a feature that you know it grows on you with time as you start observing more and more birds you will start noticing how in a bice pipit it looks distinctly as though it starts behind the eye and when you see the bice pipit from the back it is by far the most heavily streaked of the other species it's not just that there are more streakings it's quite possible that there's the same number of streakings but because the bli the blight pipit is generally an uh, a paler bird overall it appears more contrasty than the richard pipit and the paddy field pipit um so you tend to the, the streaking really stands out in case of a blight pipit compared to the other two other two pipits um otherwise in proportions i find that the blight pipit is very similar to the paddy field pipit however um it is a bit larger than the paddy field pipit and um there's just something um i don't even look at you know when i was making this presentation i was trying to think of what i look at when i see a blight pipit what what if somebody was to ask me how do you tell it's a blight pipit and not a blight pipit um my answer is well what i gave you earlier but when i actually look at this bird when i identify blight pipits there's something about the way it looks it just appears really cute and really gentle and i don't know why that is but when you look at other pipits they just don't appear as gentle um looking i think it's got something to do with the bill and the pale lores but a blight pipit just appears very cute and very innocent compared to the other pipits um one thing to note especially in uh, fresher birds which is before before the start of the year <laughs> so november december that kind of time um blight pipit appears really pale compared to other pipits so it's got a very uniform belly color compared to richards and paddy field which kind of have a rufusish brownish color where the streak is and then it becomes kind of uh, the belly becomes whiter but overall you can see the contrast from the bellies of the richards and the paddy field um, but in a blight pipit when you see it uh, you see you, the the pallor of the bird really stands out 
um what i'll do now is i will play the call um of this bird sorry so i'll start with the paddy field pipit So that's the song of the paddy field pipit. Could everybody hear that? Um, I'm really not sure if. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Cool. Good. Good to know. Um, and can you? Uh, sorry, just to confirm, can you hear this as well? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. So this is the song of the paddy field pipit, and um, the sweet, 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 sweet. sweet the song is often delivered in a little flight so you will see the bird just take off you know in the middle of a field and then parachute down to the uh, to the ground um and it is again a very distinctive characteristic of a paddy field pipit uh, also because you know no other pipit will do this in india uh, or in the plains of india where there is no other breeding pipit for us to unfortunately enjoy the songs of um and the call of the paddy field pipit is this usually is a single noted chup chup kind of thing and there's occasionally a double noted this 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 call also which is very similar to a white wagtail if you heard that one um but this is important to note because the call of the paddy field pipit again like a lot of the complex birds one of the best ways to identify them is through their calls um so the call of the paddy field pipit is an is an is a nice one to remember because no other bird will again sound like it if you are familiar with this call um richard's pipit on the other hand um so i'll play the paddy field pipit call again and here's the richard's pipit so a longer more explosive kind of sweep 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 sound and with a kind of um, harsh quality to it um, for those of you familiar with the citrine wagtail the call is very similar to that of a citrine wagtail and here's a blight pipit it sounds very similar to a richard's pipit um so i'll i'll play that again actually but it's nowhere near as harsh um as a richard pipit and i'll just compare that again so again um and blight pipit um it can i understand sound exceptionally similar especially initially when you listen to it um but once you get used to that jarring jarring quality of the richard pipit sound and then you listen to this very nasal relatively sh um you know uh, like a seep what is a treep uh, kind of quality of the blight pipit you can pick them out easily in the field and it's one of the easiest things to do when you you will not need to look at any other feature once you figure out that they call very uh, the calls are very different um between these three species um another um I haven't actually experienced this as much as literature says I should but blight pipits also when they take off um they'll make this shui kind of sound that you just heard and but when they're landing they'll often follow it up with a chup 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 kind of call um which can sound a lot unfortunately like a paddy field pipit but it's almost always preceded by this explosive sound that you heard earlier um if you hear that explosive shui followed by the chup 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 then you know especially then that it's not a richard pipit because a richard pipit doesn't have that in its repertoire um also when a richard pipit takes off um and i think you'll have to see this to sort of understand this um and maybe if you see a lot of paddy field pipits you'll figure it out straight away 
when like richard pippet takes off it feels like a really heavy bird it has this undulating flight you know like a like a woodpecker like a flame back does for example and it actually makes these you know it goes up then it goes down goes up goes down and a blight pippet never gives you that impression blight pippet gives you relatively the impression of a very light light bird um a quick note on the habitat um the paddy field pippet is um as you would have noticed it's found everywhere they it can be found in gardens and can be found in parks open landscapes uh, fields grasslands there's hardly a habitat where paddy field pipits can't be found on top of you know uh, kudremukh mountain and, and um, where you least expect them um, and so down below in river valleys and flood plains and things um, richard's pipits on the other hand um there are exceptions to this rule especially when the birds are on passage but they will almost always prefer grassy areas um especially areas which are wet um normally closer to water they prefer grass where they can actually hide into and for a bird that actually stands pretty tall um it it basically prefers habitat where it can't be seen very easily and blight pipit in contrast prefers slightly drier habitats although they can still be found in the similar kind of fields and cultivation that richard pipit self found in um i just remembered you know people always talk about the stance of a richard pipit it looks very upright it can look very upright but so can all the other birds as you can see so none of these richard pipit look very um, upright this one does compared to the paddy field pipit um so that's one example but you know so does the blight pipit it looks equally upright in this case and i think without a reference point it's very hard to say what is upright and what is not upright so maybe this is something you get a feel of but i haven't found it terribly useful in the field um here's another bird and i this is an image i saw back in i think 2009 or something and it looked like a richard pipit at the time um and you can see why it looks a lot like a richard pipit it's got that bill you know slightly curved culmen heavy streaking um it's got the white fringes so probably a young bird and a long tail it's not a richard pipit it's a tawny pipit it's a juvenile tawny pipit so the idea behind the white fringes of course is that it is a young bird but the all dark bill the dark lores of course um and the rufous ear coverts actually point towards a bird being a tawny pipit the only reason i put this image in there is to let you know that <laughs> even when you think you know everything about a richard pipit or a paddy field pipit there's always birds like these to come out and confuse you um tawny pipit is another widespread species found across the country in drier habitats uh, more in the northwest and western sides than elsewhere but it, i think it definitely goes up to west bengal um east towards west bengal um the most obvious part of a tawny pipit when i see it is just how plain it is and how much because of how plain it is that dark lores really stand out so you know when you look at it in terms of this plumage it looks like this very plain bird with a very dark loral stripe um however while it was a very useful feature especially early on um now i've come to rely on the structure of the bird a lot more as time has gone on for those of you familiar with wagtails and the structure of let's say yellow wagtails and white wagtails in particular you will notice that if you were to just look at the silhouette of a tawny pipit it looks just like a wagtail and even in the on the ground when it's running around apart from the lack of the wagging of the tail it it's more horizontal the stance appears because of the longer tail especially it looks more like a wagtail than a let's say a paddy field pipit which it can be confused with um so the things to look for are the relatively straight bill in some cases as i mentioned earlier they might be a curve to the culmen but sometimes they show a straight bill sometimes a curve to the culmen but there's hardly ever any yellow on the base of the bill there's just a pale base to the bill but it's not yellow as it is in um, let's say paddy field pipit or sometimes richard's pipit um the tail is long the head looks proportionally like that of a paddy field pipit um in adult birds you'll see faint streaking on the crown and faint streaks on the back but a clean mantle and a clean breast with some streaks you know just down the flanks which you can see in um, juvenile birds however can be very well streaked um there's streaking on the on the sides of the breast um 
Now, one of the features I, I look for are the rufous ear covers, which some birds show. For example, this juvenile does. This adult bird doesn't. But when I look at other birds, so this adult bird doesn't show the, the rufous ear coverts, but this one has a tinge of rufous to it in the ear coverts, and this is also an adult. Um, I think it's a feature, I'm not entirely sure, I think it's a feature of birds coming into adult plumage as opposed to full adults. So maybe something you see in first winter birds. There's no way, I can't be sure because I've never caught these birds and seen what they look like in the next year. Um, but yeah, generally, as you can see from these examples also, very pale, makes the laurel stripe stand out. The tail and overall stance looks very horizontal. Um, and the bill especially is, there's probably two tones to it, but there's no yellow on it, so it appears dark overall. And then you have birds like these. So this is a bird that was ID'd on many groups as a, as a tawny pipit, but it's actually a paddy field pipit. Again, you can see why you would call this a tawny. It's very plain overall, and there's a dark laurel stripe. But note how short that tail is. Note how there's a yellow to the base of the bill. There's a curved um, culmin to the upper mandible. And overall, the bird looks very compact compared to a tawny pipit. Pipits are half of the challenge of enjoying pipits is just because there's so much overlap and so much confusion, um, no matter how, how well you think you know your pipits. Another pipit that's very plain, very similar to tawny pipit in some senses, is the long-billed pipit. Um, however, if you've seen a long-billed pipit, it's, uh, it's, it's just a massive bird. It's more a thrush than a pipit. Um, and it really stands out with its completely bare, uh, plain plumage, especially the black and the, the back and the breast streaks. There's the lack of streaks on the breast and the back. Sorry about that. Um, really dark eye stripe, very long, often very broad tail, and a very heavy bill. Um, the subspecies we see in India, there's two subspecies. There's a resident subspecies. There's two resident subspecies, in fact, in the south, one from the Western Ghats in Kerala and one from the Deccan Plateau. Um, and then in the north, we get um, the Jordani subspecies, which is a migrant from, I think, Central Asia. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but there is another subspecies called the Decapitators, which has a smaller bill, but again, not so small that you would probably mistake it for a tawny pipit. Just a large enough bill, but smaller than these, the pipits we see here. So, the long bill pipit, um, again, one of the striking features in the bill is, of course, there's a yellow on the base of the mandible, but it's, I don't even compare this with the other pipit simply because it's so different, um, at least to me. So if you have any questions about long bill pipit, and generally, if you think you confuse this with any of the other birds, um, do let me know in the comment, uh, in the comment box. Um, but generally, if I would look at this, the large bill, the massive tail, the overall plumage, very plain with the dark floral stripe. Um, it's also a very dark bird in general. Um, this is the southern subspecies from near Bangalore. Uh, this is a juvenile of a long bill pipit from the Kerala Ghats. Um, again, the overall structure of the bird just strikes as something that's very unpipit like, uh, it's a bit more thrush like in many ways. Um, and this is an immature bird, so it loses those feathers very quickly um, coming into first winter and starts looking like an adult. This is from somewhere near Pune, I imagine. Um, but yeah. All right. We come to another bird, which is the upland pipit. Again, um, a very distinctive pipit. Um, in the beginning, I sh when I compared large pipits and small pipits, I said that large pipits don't have streaks on the flanks. This one does. This is the only exception to the rule. Um, but again, um, it's a pipit of the higher Himalayas um, with a very distinctive kind of habitat and a very distinctive song. It goes, chee -choo, chee -choo, chee -choo, chee -choo. Uh, you can't miss it. The seesawing sound on you know grassy open habitats of the of Himalayas um, above 2,000 meters. Um, in its habitat, it's pretty much the only pipit you're likely to encounter um, unless something else is in passage. But even when you see this, it's so distinctive. It's completely streaked above and completely streaked below with this massive bill. Um, and 
it it's very unpipet like in many of those ways but again i won't spend much time on this because it's such a distinctive bird now coming down south you have another bird which looks a lot like a plant pipit but you'll notice this is the last of the large pipits as i mentioned earlier and that's because even though the nilgiri pipit in so many ways resembles an upland pipit it's actually a different uh, it's it has a different clade altogether so it's actually more closely related to the smaller pipits which is like the tree pipit or the back pipit and, and so on um than the upland pipit again a very distinctive bird um it does share its habitat in the in the southern western ghats with paddy field pipit one of the easiest ways to tell it apart again is the extremely heavy streaking on up above streaking down the flanks and one thing you will notice that stands out a lot in this bird is the lack of a mela stripe which all other pipits have except for um oh long bill pipit and nilgiri pipit um so it looks very bare on the face um but overall again a very distinctive pipit um it often perches you know there is this habit it's very hard to see in the grass but when you flush it it often perches on small bushes or uh, if it's in a tea plantation on top of tea plants and things and and often gets very nice views that way all right we'll get to before it overwhelms you a bit more we'll get to another little confusing group uh, the tea pipits and the olive back pipits um the tree pipits are essentially characterized by their smaller size um there's the flanks are completely streaked again all small pipits like i said tend to have streaks going down the flanks um before i move on actually comparing these i'll just let you know because i see a lot of images being of tree pipits being mistaken for the blithe pipits and i'll tell you why because i forgot that point earlier um tree pipits also have distinctive streaking on the back very heavy streaking on the back and especially when seen from the back so they look like this bird with heavy streaking on the back and white wing bars and within them squarish median coverts which is a feature of the blithe pipit which is actually sorry i should really have expanded on that i didn't so in blithe pipit you can see there are squarish median coverts so within the median cover these spots here when they say squarish median covers and i'm i'm sure you've heard of this in on facebook and other forums basically these um and not the pointy bits here but the sides of these are squarish so they are a kind of rectangular in um richard's pipits they're pointy so they're they're sloping they're diagonal like that like that like that as opposed to squarish diagonal here and in paddy field pipit they're kind of in the middle the only place where i really find this useful is to tell apart the chirps pipits which are really pointy and to tell apart blithe pipits which are genuinely squarish and look very rectangular uh, all bad examples but here for example yeah again something you get used to you don't have to it's it's an important feature when it's you know being used as a mix of features to make a diagnostic decision but it can be left out as well i think um so anyway so tree pipits have these very similar median covert patterns and colors to that of the blithe pipits so unless you see them from the front you can you can easily mistake them from for blithe pipits but they are smaller and they have uh, marked lores um unlike the blithe pipits um what i especially look for in tree pipits um are uh, so the facial on the face you'll notice there's a supercilium and generally just a hint some of them have more pronounced little black and white spots some of them have little less but generally just a hint of a spot or nothing at all and generally short superciliums with streaking running down from the crown down to the through the mantle onto the back um and i'll tell you why that's important um because when you look at it's relatively a relatively similar bird the olive back pipit um the olive back pipit has a much more pronounced supercilium with the white spot with the black base standing out a lot more than it does on a uh, on the tree pipit um the other thing that i look forward to uh, i look i look for in an olive back pipit especially in the peninsula i mean i'm sorry i got off on the wrong note especially in the peninsula because is the lack of streaking on the back compared to a tawny pipit 
sorry, a tree pipit. A tree pipit has a lot more streaking on the back as opposed to a to an olive backed pipit. Um, I I can't see colors very well, but normally a lot of people are able to see the brown versus the olive on the back um, of the olive back pipit as well. But I don't find that particularly useful in the field, but I'm not very good at looking at colors either. Um, now, olive back pipit is slightly more confusing because there's actually two subspecies found in India. The subspecies we find in peninsular India is the migratory subspecies, which comes from Central Asia and beyond. Um, and that's the one with the um, lack of streaking on the back. So when you're trying to distinguish this from a tree pipit, the best way to do it, apart from face pattern, which is very important, the best way to do it is to just look at the streaking on the back. If it's got heavy streaks, it's a tree pipit. If it's got very faint streaking, it's, a, it's an olive back pipit. Um, however, there is the resident subspecies, almost resident subspecies. It's an altitudinal migrant in the Himalayas uh, called uh, it's Anthus hotsani hotsani. This subspecies is, is called Unanensis. Um, so this one, however, this one on the right here has strong back streaking, very similar to that of the tree pipit. So in this case, the best way to tell them apart from tree pipits is the color. So more olive than brown. And of course, the easiest way is the face pattern. The tree pipit has the short supercilium, generally very plain face, maybe a hint of the black dot here. But an olive back pipit will almost always, in 95% of the cases, show a distinct white spot with a black face and a nice clear supercilium. Um, this is something I find very useful on the habitats of the tree pipits and olive back pipits. In summers, uh, olive back pipits, you know, they, you find them in the high Himalayas above tree line often. And generally, you find them in grasslands and things. So it doesn't hold true for summers. But in winters, olive back pipits are almost always under the shade of trees. In fact, uh, and tree pipits will almost always be in open habitats. So open fields, you know, with some trees here and there or open open forest with enough grassland sort of in the middle of those trees interspersed. Um, very often just in open fields with no trees, but they'll perch on wires. Um, and I find this actually very useful, especially in wintering spots, not spots where they're uh, going through on passage, but in wintering spots, um, it almost always holds true that if you are seeing um, pipits under a canopy, they're likely to be olive back pipits. If you're seeing pipits under an open sky or an open canopy, then they're likely to be tree pipits. Um, the other way I put it is that if you take a photo of, uh, you know, from below of an olive back pipit and your background is green, uh, sorry, if you take a photo of the pipit and your background is green from below, um, it's likely to be an olive back pipit. But if you take a photo from below when the background is blue, it's likely to be a tree pipit. Um, not to be taken literally, but you get the idea, I hope. Um, we'll move on quickly to the last set of pipits. There's the rosy pipit. Um, when I earlier mentioned that these are the pipits that uh, show seasonality in the sense that their plumage changes with season, rosy is an excellent example. In the breeding season, it gets this beautiful pink wash on the breast. Um, and in the non-breeding season, it's just heavily streaked on the breast. Um, one of the most striking features for a rosy pipit, um, what I look for straight away, is of course this heavy streaking on the back. Um, in the breeding season, it's the breast, uh, which is rosy, is the um, heavily streaked breast in the non-breeding season. But also, I think what really makes this pipit stand out are two things on either end. One is on the face. The black bill, sharp and pointed black bill with a dark laurel stripe and a very prominent supercilium. In fact, you can't see it in this photo very well, but it goes all the way like this in many birds. And in some cases, it goes till here and then there's a white spot over here. It's kind of disconnected supercilium, but generally a long and very prominent supercilium. And um, a very contrasty olive on the wings, which is unique to this bird in this group of small pipettes. So it's got this you know, darkish plumage throughout and then this striking olive on the, on the flight feathers over here. Um, by habitat, rosy pipit in the breeding season is normally found above tree line in India, all across the Himalayas pretty much. And in uh, the winters, it comes down 
I think it comes down as far as Maharashtra, rarely, but generally above that in in wet wetlands, especially with reeds and you know dense grass cover, is where you tend to find them. Another bird um, is the red-throated pipit. Um, this is actually really interesting. Um, unlike what a lot of older literature says, which says that the birds come into breeding plumage, which is this exquisite looking bird with a red throat, you can't mistake it for anything else, um, comes into breeding plumage in the breeding season and becomes like this in the non-breeding season. That's actually not true. Um, the, the red throat um, and this plumage here is actually a progression of adults. So this is a juvenile bird over here with no, th with no red on the throat. Um, the first winter and beyond birds with 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 smudge with, you know with the smudging of red on the throat but heavy heavy streaking nonetheless and then there's the adult bird with red on the throat coming down to the upper breast and then turning into streaking now the caveat here is that the females actually don't come into this plumage uh, sometimes so you see a lot of these birds which are actually full grown adults but might be females without the red throat um, things to look out for on in this pipit the easiest way to tell them apart of course if they're in breeding plumage is the red throat but otherwise they are pretty much the only pipit in this group which has ridiculously strong streaking running down from the crown through the mantle onto the back really contrasty strong streaking especially on the back and then also on the uh, underparts um, and I'll come to this again later, why this, this is a feature of this bird that really stands out compared to others. As you could see, um, in a rose, in the only comparison it could have is with the rosy pipit, which has similar streaking, but the face in itself is very different. It doesn't have the dark lores. It doesn't have a long supercilium like a rosy pipit does. It has a relatively short supercilium and no dark lores to compare. So it's actually quite easy to tell apart from a rosy pipit. It's much rarer in India, um, much rarer in India in general, and but regular in places like Andamans and probably regular elsewhere, just overlooked. Um, the next pipit is the buff bellied pipit. Again, easy to tell apart in its breeding plumage. Uh, just a very plain pipit with uh, very pale lows. Um, but the plumage we see in India is this non breeding plumage. Um, this one is from Pong which is, I think, the best place to see this bird. But um, in this case, note how heavily streaked the underparts are, especially the neck. So it looks like it has a necklace. So in the breeding plumage also, it has this heavy, heavy, you know, blotch on the mela stripe, basically coming down to the side of the breast. Same thing in the non-breeding plumage. But the upper parts remain unstreaked. And this combination actually is really important because, you know, just like the olive back pipette, it's very unique to this pipette. Um, in this group of uh, rosy, red-throated, buff-bellied, and water pipettes. So if you see heavy streaking on below, but very faint, vague streaking on the on the top, um, you're looking, I would say, at a buff-bellied pipet. Um, other than that, the important points to note are the, the lack of uh, any laurel stripe. Um, even in the breeding plumage, there's no actual laurel stripe, it's just the contrast which adds to the to the point, you know, to the, to the impression that there might be something on the lows. And then there's a water pipit, which I think for the longest time was considered a somewhat rare pipit, but is actually quite common um, in most wetlands uh, across the northwest of, side of the country, especially around Punjab and Haryana, um, Himachal Pradesh, and coming down into Rajasthan, and lately around Delhi in general. Um, one of the st standout features of this, of this bird um, is the the black bill and the black legs, um, but as you will notice, compared to all the other birds, it has the faintest streaking um, in comparison to rosy, red-throated, and buff-bellied pipit. So it's got streaks on the back. It's got streaks down below, um, but the streaking itself is very faint and very vague. Um, the lores tend to be pale in non-breeding birds. Um, but it can seem to have a lower, laurel stripe of sorts in the breeding plumage. Um, one thing to be wary of, and one thing why I recommend looking at streaking as, a, as an ID point, pointer, 
and generally washed out plumage as an ID pointer as opposed to the black bill and legs. When the black bill and legs are there, they're diagnostic, sort of. Um, but there are often birds such as this one here, the photograph taken by Kavi from near uh, Gurgaon, where they show very distinct bases to the bill, uh, yellow base to the bill. And there's actually a lot of such examples you'll see all across, you know, various image libraries of this bird, where the, the bill isn't actually entirely black. Um, so just a bit of precaution to take away. Uh, I've summed it up between these four pipettes um, in this chart. I'm not sure if all of you can see these lines. I'm not sure what they are, but they've just appeared here suddenly. Um, but anyway, so what I look for is the back sticking and the breast sticking as the main features. As I said, rosy pipette and red throated pipette, they show strong um, streaking on both sides, um, but the rest of the features differ. Um, buff bellied pipette and the water pipette have uh, the combination of the streaking is actually very different to these two pipettes um, and can actually be used uh, singularly to tell them apart from the others. All right, that's it. That's all the pipettes you can find in India. There is the chance of some, maybe someday someone will find a meadow pipette, but it hasn't happened yet, so I haven't included it in my. Um, <laughs> in this webinar. Um, so I think we should be open to the to any questions now or if you want me to repeat or go through something, anything at all basically. Thank you. Um, I <laughs> Hello. Yeah, hi. Those who can come to the chat and ask question to Ramit, that's better. Okay, let me ask one question. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so once it comes to olive bag and the tree pipette, uh, is there a, uh, any difference in their call? Hello? Pramit, please. Ramit, you are not audible. Ramit, you are muted. Yeah, I, now, okay. Yeah. Am I fine now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can, you are yeah. audible now, yeah. Okay. So, in uh, olive back pipettes and tree pipettes, um, one of the, the, the calls are very similar. On a sonogram, however, um, tree pipettes have a, have a lower frequency compared to olive back pipettes. But that's pretty much it. It's very hard otherwise to tell them apart by call. Uh, tree pipettes and olive bag pipettes both sound like a um, you know, when they're flying through and they're very soft, thin, seep, seep, seep kind of calls. But I, I can't tell them apart by ear. I can tell them apart on a sonogram, however. Right. Thank you. No worries. Can we just go through the chat? group uh, there's quite a few questions there okay so determining the age of the oh, sorry for let's see so i have got <laughs> okay give me uh, give me a minute i'll just go through this from the beginning so do i have a comparison table for large pipettes the reason i don't like making comparison table for large pipettes is because as you probably figured out I rely heavily on structure, which I think is the best way to distinguish these pipettes. Um, and on plumage markers, which are not diagnostic in themselves, but are diagnostic when used in combination with a number of plumage markers. Um, 
and unfortunately i think a comparison table boils it down to a level of simplicity that really isn't um, the case uh, you know in these pipettes it's very hard to actually um, make it simple because i guess it isn't a very simple topic unfortunately um some of the keys i used earlier like i said are structure the build shape median covered patterns the lows and the amount of streaking on the back and the front um and i think when you just look at all of these things in uh, from, you know together you can come to one decision or the other it becomes a game of probabilities almost um next question uh are there any pointers to tell males and females apart um unless you see the mating um or you see um, a bird singing in which case it is most likely to be male as far as i know pipettes haven't had bird uh, female songs recorded yet um the that there's no dimorphism in pipettes um mr large chunk of the top uh, between differences in id between blights and tony and richard and patty bill i think for any of you who missed the talk i think it's been recorded can you confirm that david that it's been recorded and it will be available um, it it is recorded it will be available soon okay okay so it will be available so you can catch up on that any time later um one thing i would like to say is um, i i expected i did not expect such a large turnout i thought there will be a few people um and we can have an informal discussion of sorts so i never made a ppt i only made a ppt today and so i picked up images from all over the place i hope i've given everybody credits um and i'm sorry if you didn't appreciate me borrowing your images um okay is there what is the life span of a pipit i am not sure um they are definitely four or five years i've followed a paddy field pipit and that's nested in the same spot pretty much for four or five years but i'm not sure beyond that unfortunately i probably have to look into some other book i think what i would recommend is pipits and wagtails by uh, by Per Alstrom um that's an amazing book and has a lot about the ecology and general features of all of these birds um what about the stands with paddy field and richards uh, by mohawk um like i said earlier there is a difference in the stands um however it is very hard to actually establish that difference unless and until you see the birds together so i'll just quickly take you to that part of the slide again so this is the paddy field pipit and all of its stances fairly horizontal occasionally upright for example this bird in the autumn is fairly upright but and this is the richard's pipit but again these look as upright as the as the paddy field pipit above only when you see them together you sort of notice how upright a richard's pipit is but again that's not always the case when it's feeding it's not upright when it's perched on a wire maybe it is when it's alert maybe it is the back claw is very long yes the hind claws are very long but again they are very long when you see them with in reference to some other bird you know for example and also in reference to the paddy field that richard's tail is quite long yes so we 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 discussed all of this earlier in the earlier part of the talk but again with the hind claws remember that they are very variable this is also a paddy field hind claw this is also a paddy field hind claw so they are just generally very variable um okay i think there are no new questions available um uh, what is I... yes ronit hi ramit you permit uh, ramit just wanted to know on field uh, yes. like how do you uh, work on separating the uh, tawny from the blights in case you are seeing them side by side tawny from blights yeah um so blights is by far the most heavily streaked of the larger pipits okay um quite frankly when you see a blights from the back especially and the pale lows Mm -hmm. they are such a contrast to tawny pipits look at the heavy streaking here and the lows here over here very plain right but in a tawny pipit even in the heavily marked tawny pipit you will still see marked lows and okay. nowhere near as much of a contrast from the streaking um as you would on a blights apart so from that so lows would be a distinctive feature to separate them between blights and tawny yes yeah. another okay. thing for a for a young tawny which is also streaked the roof the ear coverts as i mentioned earlier are always rufous which is not the case for uh, here also uh, which is not the case for blight pipits okay. thanks yeah. thanks sir yeah nobody is there any difference in feeding behavior of paddy richards and blights 
Um, not not so much. In fact, like I said earlier, Paddy Field and Richard Pipits are actually conspe- specific for the longest time before they were split. Um, so there's not many differences in terms of feeding. They their habitat differs. Uh, Richard's prefer tol- prefers taller and better grass, um, and Blythe's uh, prefers drier areas. Um, yeah, but that's about it. Um, what is the use of the long hind claws? Very good question. I have no idea. Um, even wagtails have long, long hind claws, which so it's, and and so does so do the African group long claws, and they're all part of the same family Motacillidae. So maybe there's uh, some genetic aspect to this, but I'm not really sure what what the use of hind, long hind claws is. If you do get to know, please do let us know also. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, hi, Ramit Pranad here. Hi, Pranad. Okay, uh, so initial part of the presentation when you were talking about how you determine the age of the uh, pipettes, right. I because I had some issues with the audio. If you okay. could quickly run through the pointers, uh, not a longish this thing. Okay. okay, I'll do it very, very quickly. In a juvenile pipette, so I've taken the case study here as a paddy field pipette, but this holds true for pretty much all similar pipettes, you know, paddy field, uh, Tony, Richards, Blythe's. Uh, in a juvenile pipette, these uh, scalation, scale-like feathers uh, are consistent throughout the back. So they all appear heavily streaked. Luckily in our area, if you see a pipette like this, it has to be paddy field because um, they're not migrating just yet. Um, so it'll have to be pad- paddy field pipette as the only resident species in our region. Um, after this, they quickly, so there's another example of the juvenile plumage, right? Um, after this, uh, you must also notice the fringing to the median coverts, and this is important because we know that a lot of the, one of the features you look for is the white fringes to the blight pipettes and the tree pipettes, for example, as a marker. So a lot of the young birds actually have pale fringes to the median coverts, and they only get paler as they come into first winter plumage. So it almost appears like a wing bar. Um, so this is the time of the year when you see. Blythe Stippets and Richard Stippet also, and they will be migrating at this time. So all of them will have um, pale fringes. So you have to be very careful around, especially in the beginning of winter, to make sure that you're separating them on other features rather than just the pale fringes. In this case, all of the f- pipettes, their, their streaking appears more like mottling because the, weather, the feathers are getting slightly worn out. Um, and the pale fringing is there. Most pipettes at this time will also show this yellow gape, which shows that they're an immature. Um, after that, through the winter, they'll come into their adult plumage. The streaking in the case of a paddy field pipette becomes less defined. In case of Richards and Blythe, it'll become more defined. But the paler fringes kind of are becoming, as you will see, buffier now. So they're becoming more the truer color of what they're supposed to be. So this is I have a question. Paddy field. I'll just finish this off, Mitra. Thank you. And then in autumn, they'll come on to their full plumage, which is generally all brownish, has more defined streaks or, you know, autumn's actually the most worn out bird. So actually it has no streaks and generally paler washed out loads before coming back into the adult winter plumage, which has a defined load and, you know, the concurrent color of the median coverts in these birds. But in blight pits, of course, they'll be completely white. In Richard's pits, they will be very similar to this. I hope that helps. It's not. <laughs> uh, oh, that is very helpful. Thank you so much, Ramit, for quickly going through it again. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Uh, Ramit? Yes. Uh, Dipu here. Uh, yes. So, uh, will you share some more details on the, uh, the uh, nesting ground or the breeding ground of these birds? Um, I'll quickly run through some of them. Uh, Rosie Pippet breeds in the upper Himalayas. Uh, so the ones that breed in India include olive-backed, rosy pipit, paddy field pipit, paddy field pipit all across, of course, olive-backed and rosy in the higher Himalayas. Um, the subspecies of Richards we see here co- comes from across the Central Asia, Eastern Asia belt. Similarly, with blight pipits, blight pipits actually breeds up in Eastern Eastern Asia, uh, closer to where Amur falcons breed. Um, tawny pipits all across Central Europe, so you know just north of north of Turkey. Caspian Sea, all those areas. Similar for the subspecies that we see in the North India of long billed pipit. Um, the olive bat pipit that migrates to peninsular India actually is the olive bat pipit that breeds up in Central Asia and beyond in Siberia, Unanensis. 
um, and then buff bellied pipit is called the american pipit it's normally the east asian side water pipit for the north uh, caspian sea side but yeah i think the rest you can look up you can look up maps and probably figure out more accurately what these are yeah thanks a lot and uh, one one more so yes. how many species of pipits are, uh, are recognized till date around the world jeez that's a very good question i cannot give you a number off the top of my head but there's pipits there's long claws which are also pipits and then there's a families like madangas and and things which are also in the family of pipits but are nothing they're almost like nut nut hatches just look them up look up a family tree of pipits and i'm sure you'll find the answer right. um yeah sorry about that um is there is in tree pipit is there any flight patterns a uh, very straight flight not undulating like the larger pipits but almost all of the pipits have relatively straight uh, flight patterns nothing nothing very uh, diagnostic in, in itself is there any difference of the nesting behavior of nilgiri pipit compared to other pipits i think they all nest on the ground uh, but whether you might have to look up literature for that i'm sorry i'm not aware of uh, any particular differences um i think nilgiri pipits do appreciate some scrub in their habitats uh, although they are very grassland favoring birds difference between pipit and lark very quickly uh, we did go through this right in the beginning um larks in appearance tend to have um bigger bills a bulkier shorter tail but the best way to tell them apart in the field is just to see their behavior uh pipits are completely insectivorous so you see them making short darts you know short zigzagging runs towards insects and things but uh, larks are partly herbivorous partly insectivorous so they often appear more like grazing birds so they tend to you know uh, stick around and they much slower and they much quarter as they as they graze along the grass they don't have those you know short runs that uh, pad, that pipits make can you please show the slides of water pipit and rosy pipit please fortunately i'm using a very bad pdf platform um very hard to go through them quickly just give me a second and thank you to everybody who's been passing through compliments so this is the rosy pipit here uh heavy streaking up on back up be down below very prominent supercilium red throated pipit heavy streaking up above down below but not a prominent supercilium and plain lores unlike a rosy pipit buff bellied pipit plain back dark streaking down below pale lores and water pipit fine streaking weak streaking whatever you want to call it ab above and down below and pale paleish lores so a uh, sort of if you can take a screenshot of this that will do pretty much are we all good or did you know the difference between tree pipit and olive back pipit tree pipits don't breed in india so that's one one thing to keep in mind uh, anything you see in the higher himalayan grasslands are olive back pipits um unless in passage season of course um apart from that in the peninsula in the wintering season tree pipits and olive back pipits mingle um in the same same altitudes but very different habitats as i mentioned in the presentation Uh, Ramit Pranad here once again. Uh, one Pranad. question about behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, many pipits like the Paddy Field, Richards Blitz, you don't see them uh, running off or flying off into the trees. Uh, but sometimes small flocks, you see them flying off into the trees. Uh, very difficult to identify mm -hmm. when they quickly fly off. Is are there any particular pipits which show this kind of behavior uh, using trees to get away from predators? So actually, actually, uh, blight pipit often perches on trees. you are right about the others and where there are wires uh, blights paddy field and uh, richards always uh, tend to use wires as a place to escape you know when they get flushed they'll actually often if they don't go back into the grass again they'll go into on top of wires and things in fact the opening of the presentation was a uh, a shot of all the uh, richards pipits that i had accidentally flushed <laughs> on the wires um but tree olive back pipits are the ones that normally go on trees regularly 
um but so do blights actually so do blights where there are trees they will actually use trees very often okay thank you yep, no worries so these are all richard spipets on the wires there's a white browed wagtail here and over here but the rest are all richard spipets All right. Um, it's okay. one a.m. in Australia where I am right now, yes. so we'll try and bring this to a close now. Hopefully, I think yeah, it's, the questions are almost over, Ramit. Yep. Yeah, someone awesome. like Savitri Singh um, commented. You know, gladly, very confused. Wonderful. So um, objective achieved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, I think uh, is there. I think I don't see any other questions. uh i think i just add one more thing i i i hope you remember our talks by per astrom in uh, chambal the roar 200 birders we were all sitting there he gave a fantastic uh, talk later we all got out went outside we saw a pipet no one could identify so that was like total confusion <laughs> anyway i hope all of you have learned a lot uh, thank you so much from uh, uh, the side of kottayam nature society and uh, alappi naturalist society um sorry a uh, um, lot of people couldn't uh, see the presentation or hear it we will be uh, uploading it will be soon in a youtube or somewhere so keep it up on that and uh, there will be more presentations more talks will be coming up next few days yep thank you so much david and everyone else um it was good fun thank you